the start of my great presentation for this week. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be joined by Dr. Mike and Dr. Greg. And I am going to turn it over to Dr. Michael DiMiuga, who is going to talk about the one in six, the things that slow you down. Dr. Mike, take it away. Hey, Woodson, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Very good. It was a wonderful fall day in Florida. I actually had to pull on a long sleeve shirt. Imagine <laughs> that. So, uh, the one in six, things that will slow you down. And the reason why I put this title one in six, lots of folks, of course, believe that they have unique situations. And for the most part, that is true. But there are certain things that are common across the board. And so the reason why it's one in six, I actually initially wrote down six things common to most people that will cause the slowdown in the weight loss journey. And then I realized that there was one overriding concept or overriding issue that needed to be addressed as well, and it's clearly shown in this slide. Nutrition is always the base. Our system depends very much on homeopathic principles, and that is to work with the body, not against it. By way of example, I, my type of training is in allopathic medicine, so my medicine is to treat symptoms and to try to force the body to do different things. For example, if my patient has a high cholesterol level, I put them on a medication that forces the liver to stop functioning the way it normally would. Now, the good news is, the cholesterol level goes down. The bad news is, every now and then, the liver says, no, we don't want this, we don't like this. So, in order to work with the body, we have to address the most basic need of the body, and that is nutrition. If the body does not have what it needs to do the work that it needs to do, then it cannot possibly bring you to health. And in this particular situation, it might be malnutrition will keep you both skinny and obese. Everyone understands the refugee camp look, that's the common perception of malnutrition, but that's really undernutrition. Because in the medical field, there is also overnutrition, and it is also considered a component of malnutrition, the obese and therefore the sick. In both cases, it's very hard for the body to heal itself, and so we must pay attention to nutrition. That is always the base, which is why whenever I start anyone on this program, one of the first questions I ask them has to do with the general nutritional state. It has happened multiple times. I look at the individual and I won't let them start on the actual program itself because my assessment is they are nutritionally lacking. I first put them on the optimals, the vitamins and the minerals. And sure enough, multiple times now, the individual has started losing weight simply because I put them on proper nutrition. Now, it may not be rapid enough weight loss for them to get to the goal that they want, but I have no business forcing their body to lose fat unless I take care of the nutritional needs of the body first. So, having said that, if you are not taking a good multivitamin and or the optimals in the program, then I suggest that you do so. If you think that taking a multivitamin or a supplement is kind of, sort of, optional, um, it's not. Not in this day, not in this day and age that we live in. So, having said all of that, we go on to the actual six other items. So, everyone believes that they're unique, but there are some things in common. And the next slide shows these six common denominators that will slow you down on your weight loss journey. And we will go over each one of these in some detail. But the six listed are water, or specifically water intake, sugar bombs, which we covered last week, toxins and toxin exposure, fat and the role in health, constipation, as well as exercise. So let's move on to the next slide. We cover these items in a little bit more detail. When I sit down and ask somebody how much they drink, the answer is never a number. And understand, I asked for a, I asked a question that should have been answered with a number. How much water do you drink in a day? It should be five glasses, 32 ounces, whatever. It should be a number. But everyone says they drink a lot. 
or I drink plenty, oh, I, I, I make sure to drink my water. And the interesting thing is everyone thinks that they drink a lot. And the best example I always have is if you, here in the state of Florida, happen to be working outdoors all day long, if you tell me that you drink a gallon of water throughout the day, and then you come in at the end of the day and I ask you for a urine sample and you cannot give me a urine sample, then you're dehydrated. It doesn't matter how much you drink. What matters is how much your body has left over to be able to do what it needs to do with the water. And a fairly straightforward way to measure that is whether or not your kidneys are seeing, so to speak, enough water to turn some of it into urine. If it's not seeing enough water, then it doesn't matter how much you drank, you're dehydrated. And most Americans actually walk around in a chronic state of mild to moderate dehydration. So the guideline is 100 ounces of water per 24 hours if you weigh 200 pounds or less. If you weigh more than 200 pounds, then you take any weight above the 200 and take half of that in ounces of water and add that to the 100. Now, lots of people say, well, no, that's a lot of water. I'm going to be going to the bathroom constantly. Initially, yes, your body and your kidneys especially will need to get used to that. But it will work. Your body will adapt. The other thing to consider is we are flushing out toxins and we are flushing out fat with water. So you need a lot of the water to move things the way they should. The second item, sugar bombs, hidden sugars and how to diffuse them. We devoted some time last week to this specific subject. Hidden sugars are sugar lookalikes and or names that the food industry has used to try to get around admitting as to how much sugar a particular product has. And it's interesting because over the course of the last couple of days, I came across a news article on the internet. It was geared towards mothers and it was designed for a mother to be aware of what they feed their young children. But it basically said, you might be thinking that you're giving your child a healthy breakfast, but here are 10 items that have a lot of sugar hidden in them. And the interesting thing was, we just about covered every single one of them in the presentation last week. So what happens when you consume something that does not, that has a lot of sugar, I'm sorry, that has a lot of sugar but you're not aware of? Your body reacts to that sugar. It sees a spike in blood sugar levels. Insulin production goes ramping way high. And now, instead of your body burning calories on an ongoing basis, your liver is now forced to deal with that onslaught of sugar, convert a fair amount, if not all of it, depending on the type of sugar, convert it into fat, and then store it. So now you've just sabotaged your entire journey. And the bad news is every time you consume a sugar bomb, your progress either slows down or stops completely for three days. So sugar bombs. If you missed the presentation last week, the good news is you have access to them in the um, training vault. Um, Woodson will, I'm sure, make all those um, webinars and trainings available. Number three, toxins. What, why, and how? Here's the short version. Every day that we walk out the door, drive up and down the highways, inhale the air, eat produce, we are being exposed to toxins. These toxins are the hydrocarbons in the air, the pollution. These toxins are pesticide residues on our fruits and vegetables, and unless we specifically wash with a detergent or soap and water our produce, we're not really getting rid of the pesticide residues. This could be um, radioactive substances that are normally found in the soil that we are exposed to. Um, it could also well be drugs that you are placed on. It is quite well accepted now that as many good things as prescription drugs can do for you, there's quite a few side effects. And sometimes it's the side effect of the drug that becomes the limiting factor. Well, if you are not using that yucky stuff, I have yet to meet somebody, anybody on this program who just loves the Restorix. But Restorix was designed specifically to get rid of toxins on an ongoing basis. Because as we've covered before, 
a lot of these toxins that we are exposed to regularly and unconsciously are stored in fat tissue. Our body has to keep fat cells around to keep the toxin level down. If we try to lose the fat but not remove the toxins, what happens is individuals get sick, they come down with a whole host of symptoms, and there will be a specific standalone segment that covers what these symptoms are, why they show up, and how to handle them. The short version is, if you've had some success losing some weight, and then all of a sudden, despite your best effort, things seem to have slowed down or completely stalled out, ask yourself if you're continuing to use the Restorix, the detox product, because if you are not, that's the key. You need to get ahead of the toxins so that your body can continue to release the fat. The next item on the list happens to be fat. And on the program, we actually have a supplement that is just about 100% good fat. Now, here's the key. Your body needs fat to stay healthy. So many of the hormones in the body are, in fact, fat-based. In fact, most of our hormones are based off of cholesterol. The body takes in fatty acids, triglycerides, makes a cholesterol molecule out of it, and then depending on what the body needs, the cholesterol molecule is further modified, and all of a sudden you talk about testosterone, estrogen, a whole host of hormones dependent on the fat. Well, here's the bad news. Any fat, if the body needs fat, any fat will do, even if it's actually sick, unhealthy fat that is causing you a whole host of health problems. In order to keep the weight loss going, and especially the fat loss going, we must let the body see a certain amount of good, healthy fat so that the bad fat is released. And that's the omega Q. If you are not using the omega Q, if not using a high quality fat supplement, then I would suggest to you, you need to get that going. Because it's not fat consumption that makes you fat, it is the consumption of too many carbs and especially simple carbs. Now, the next item, constipation. And I have to apologize for those of you who might not be familiar with redneck language. This I got from a close friend. Just because you're moving don't mean you ain't. What this means is the gastrointestinal tract is basically a fixed length of tube. At some point, the tube gets completely filled up. If you then put more stuff into the tube, also known as eating something, something has to go out the other end of the tube. So you may be moving on a daily basis and therefore think that you're not constipated, but in reality, you're simply moving stuff to make room for the new stuff. To really say that you're not constipated, you must evacuate the lower third of your large intestine on a regular basis. And so the terms, and yes, it gets somewhat colorful sometimes, is we talk about if you're not passing ropes, if you're passing pebbles or rocks, you're constipated. You really need to be passing ropes. And I'm going to stop there and let the imagery sink in. Now, part of what causes constipation is not enough water intake. So guess what? That ties back into the first item. Part of what causes constipation is a lack of fiber. Part of what causes constipation is not having enough of the different minerals and elements that your gastrointestinal tract needs for optimal functioning. And that goes back to making sure that you're using the optimals. The last item on the list is probably the most misunderstood item, and that is exercise. You can lose weight on this program without a lot of exercise. In fact, some of our most successful stories were people who were, in fact, so obese or so physically unable to exercise that they still lost weight despite no exercise. But a very good thing happens as you lose the weight you start feeling better, you start feeling stronger, and you start thinking to yourself, I wonder how much faster I can make things go if I add exercise. And, and here's where old thinking intersects with new knowledge. The old thinking was if you simply exercise more and more and more and ate less and less and less, then you know weight loss should speed up faster and faster and faster. 
And that's just not the case anymore because if you start exercising more and more and you're not feeding your body extra calories to take care of the exercise, the body specifically starts clamping down on any further fat loss. The analogy that I have used time and time again is, if you know you've overdrawn your bank account, if you go to the bank with your ATM card and you try to withdraw money, you cannot get any more money out until you put some money in. Same thing, if you're actually exercising, you might need to increase your calorie intake. Now, the best, most recent example I have of this is a nurse that we started on the program. She had the bad back, bad hips, bad knees. And with the weight loss and the improvement in muscle mass, she started exercising and exercising and exercising. And I have increased her calorie intake a total of 600 calories in 200 calorie increments. 200 calories the first time, another 200 calories, and then another 200 calories. She has continued to lose weight and gain muscle, but she's now eating 600 calories more than when she first started the program. And understand, she was already eating more on this program than she was eating on every other program she had done before. So that is the last part of the equation. If you're already exercising very, very heavily and then you put yourself on too restricted a calorie intake, your body's going to say, nah, we're not losing the weight, we're going to hold on to everything. And in fact, and yes, it sounds counterintuitive, but what you might need to do to get the weight loss going is to actually start feeding your body more calories, but it has to be in a fairly carefully controlled situation. You actually need to get a good handle on how many calories you're burning from the exercises and then add back what you're burning, not in excess. So those are the six common denominators that when people get started, either hold them back from getting good results. I have lots of folks who say, well, I can't possibly start drinking that much water or I can't possibly use the detox product. And then they come in and say, how come this is not working as fast as I wanted to? Or you may have already started the program and had some initial great success and then things start to slow down some. And this, these are the factors. If you've pulled away from the detox, if you're becoming a little sloppy with the water tracking, if you've ramped up your exercise, these are the items that you're going to have to pay attention to. And I would encourage you to get back with your health coaches to get guidance on how to get around these issues. So rather than think of these as things that you have to pay attention to every now and then only, I think that the next slide best summarizes what you really need to think of. This is the first month of the rest of your life. The habits, the activities, the knowledge that you gain here will then serve you going forward. So, for example, the reason why I always talk about how good and how well integrated Migrate 28 is, is shown in the next few slides. Migrate 28 is an integrated approach to managing weight issues. It doesn't use just one thing and hope that it works well. No, no, no. We take a whole bunch of different things that we know work and we put the best together. It's multidisciplinary. We use homeopathic medicine. We use allopathic medicine. It's an educational process so you don't ever have to diet again because really, once you've formed new habits, that sets the stage for the next month and the next month and the next month. And the next slide shows this very nicely. New knowledge, or better yet, a better understanding of old knowledge will guide you to the best results possible. And call it a lifestyle change because it's certainly not a diet. You start and stop a diet. Lifestyle stays. And you'll know that you've learned a new lifestyle when you no longer automatically do the things that you used to do when they were your old bad habits. So long as you're constantly every now and then thinking about I need to or I want to or why am I going to the pantry or to the vending machine at this time, okay. You haven't broken that habit yet. The lifestyle's not quite there yet. Once you have developed new habits, then it becomes a whole new lifestyle. And like I said, lifestyles change. Diets come and go. I highly encourage everyone, don't diet. 
I tell people, this is not a diet. This is going to be a lifestyle change. And if you're not willing to make those changes, well, then, you know, this may not be the program for you. But if you are serious in your needs and wants, this is what will work for you. So those were the one and six. And I believe that that is the end of my current section. It is, but that was incredible. And um, I can attest to somebody who said, I'm drinking enough water. I'm drinking plenty of water. I drink water all day. And then when I started documenting um, how much water I was drinking, I was not drinking enough. And that helped me more than anything that there was. Um, and so I love all of those. But I'm just telling you guys, if, for those of you saying you're drinking enough water, you're not. So um, you've got to <laughs> document it and get in that habit and everything. That was just um, that was incredible. And now we're going to switch gears to Dr. Greg, who's going to talk about oxidative stress. And I've heard about the burnout syndrome, and now it's the rust out syndrome. And I didn't realize oxidative stress was literally like your body resting from the inside out, and it's something that we all deal with. So Dr. Greg, we are so excited you're here with us. Tell us all about um, oxidative stress and why we need to be knowledgeable of it and turn it around. Well, I'm so happy to be here tonight, uh, Woodson, to, to talk about this. You know, this, this is a topic that, uh, you know, you know, I learned about in medical school and uh, and really took it seriously. But I sort of put it in the back of my mind, you know, for many years. You know, you know, as a physician, you you deal with the, you know, the everyday problems that your patients uh, present with, and you treat them one at a time. But it was only after you know really listening to uh, Dr. Ray Strand and doing a little more reading um, you know, over the last uh, year and a half, two years, that it really sort of brought me back to, you know, to those uh, medical school days when I first learned about oxidative stress and said, wow, this is really important. And it really, really is. But, you know, I'd like to go back to uh, what Dr. Mike said, you know, about <clears throat> malnutrition. And, um, you know, that first slide, you know, that you're undernourished or overnourished. And historically speaking, 90% of morbidity and mortality has been due to malnutrition. And in the past, it was the lack of nutrition. But today, it's the wrong kind of nutrition, an, an excessive amount of you know, meaningless calories and carbohydrates and bad fats that are really causing you know, our health care you know, um, uh, burden uh, to skyrocket. So um, I really enjoyed it, uh, Dr. Mike's presentation. The, um, this is an apple. You know, it's a cut apple. And, um, you know, when we look at the left-hand side of that apple, it doesn't look so good, you know. And we have to ask ourselves, well, what happened to that, you know? But this is a naturally occurring process. You know, any fruit that you cut, the cut surface will change colors and change color fairly rapidly. And this is due to the effect of oxygen. And not just oxygen, but how oxygen interacts with living tissue. And an apple, even though it's, it's, you know, picked off a tree, it's still, in essence, you know, alive. There's still, you know, biologically active, you know, cells um, doing what they do to try to, um, you know, um, um, preserve itself and make sure that the seeds in that apple can produce other apple trees, if at all possible. Okay? So this is a naturally occurring process, you know, how oxygen affects tissues. But I think what's more important is the right-hand side of the apple. What is protecting the right-hand side of that apple from these changes, these oxidative changes? And the, the answer is plain and simple, antioxidants, okay? Now, you know, I grew up on a farm, you know, we raised a lot of stuff. And, and one of the things that my mom used, you know, was, uh, was uh, fruit fresh to keep the fruit looking fresher longer, you know, when she was making preserves and doing other things. And basically what that was was ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Vitamin C is a very potent antioxidant, but there are other antioxidants out there, and we're going to talk about that. So let's move on to the next slide, Woodson. What are... What are <clears throat> what are free radicals? And free radicals um, are, in, in what we're talking about today, 
are radicalized oxygen species. That's the ROS in the upper left-hand corner. Okay, and, and what happens, oxygen in nature, um, it can take several different forms. Okay, but free radicals in, in, our, in our talk tonight are oxygen molecules that have lost an electron. Okay, now these, ten, these are not natural. They go around searching for a way to gather another electron, and they can cause damage. They can cause damage to tissues in our cells. The DNA, the proteins, and the lipids. The DNA is basically the blueprint for uh, the operation of the cells, for the, for the production of new cells. So you can imagine that if the DNA gets damaged, and if it gets damaged in the right spot, that can cause some pretty lasting harm. Okay, either the cell's not going to be able to function to do what it's supposed to do, or at an extreme, if the damage is enough, could potentially lead to defects in the DNA, mutations in the DNA. Most of the time, fortunately, these mutations are not harmful and um, the cell will die, but occasionally those mutations might um, lead to changes that could, uh, could cause potentially malignant changes, cancers. So that's a pretty important uh, um, you know, problem. Proteins, proteins are the basic building blocks of cells. They are also messengers, the um, enzymes and other things that cause cellular functions to occur. So you damage these enough and guess what? Same thing happens. And then the lipids, the lipids primarily uh, uh, come into play with the membranes of cells. You know, you have a, a, a double phospholipid uh, uh, layer <clears throat> and the, the lipids are on the outside. Um, which uh, uh, make it water, water impermeable so that the intracellular fluids stay inside the cells and the extracellular fluids stay outside of the cells. Um, so damage to this can cause disruption of the cell membranes, leaking things in or out that shouldn't be there and could eventually um, damage or destroy the cells. Now, the body has to spend a lot of energy Okay, repairing these these um, potentially harmful changes, and so a lot of what the cell has to do in terms of uh, dealing with these uh, free radicals um, it takes energy from other um, vital restorative, reparative, um, you know, health maintenance types of functions, and in a nutshell, can lead to premature aging. Okay, so uh, an extremely important topic, and there's a lot of research ongoing um, in this area. Um, let's advance to the next slide, Woodson. Now, where do free radicals come from? Now, when we think of, you know, free radicals, we often think of things that are in our environment. And Dr. Mike already talked about the air pollutants, the hydrocarbons in the airs. Uh, there's, um, you know, all the pesticide residues. All of these things can cause free radicals in the body. One of the most um, important um, voluntary sources of free radicals is smoking. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later um, when we talk about the effects of uh, uh, free radicals and oxidative stress on tissues. But <clears throat> smoking causes a lot of free radicals. Okay, ionizing radiation, you know, uh, it's in the soils, you know, it's in the air. Um, most of the time it's in very limited amounts, but that can cause uh, um, a free radical formation. I recently moved to Palm Springs. We have, 90, we have uh, five days um, of uh, clouds um, and, and uh, 360 days of sunshine. So guess what? I'm getting exposed to a lot more ultraviolet uh, light, and so I'm concerned about that, and so I take um, take things, supplements, that will help limit, uh, reduce the amount of free radicals in my system. But the most important source of free radicals are actually the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cells. They provide the energy that our cells need to do what they're supposed to do. Okay, And in a nutshell, they consume 95% of the oxygen 
that we inhale on a daily basis. Okay? And in that process, these mitochondria produce a lot of free radicals. And we're going to talk about what you can do, you know, supplement-wise, to help make sure that these mitochondria produce fewer free radicals. Because there are several different pathways that the mitochondria can utilize to produce the energy. And some of these pathways produce a lot more free radicals than the preferred pathway. And we'll talk about that in a little, a little later. So let's move on to the next slide, Woodson. Okay. What is a free radical? Well, oxygen normally has a late eight electrons. And uh, normally in nature, it's paired. There's two oxygen atoms together. Um, but when we're talking about metabolism, when we're talking about the use of oxygen to produce energy, it's one oxygen molecule at a time. Now, sometimes the split itself will lead, lead to an, electron, or, uh, an oxygen molecule with seven electrons and one with nine electrons. But also during the course of energy metabolism, that oxygen molecule may be left with seven electrons and one just bounces off somewhere. Okay? Now, this is unstable by nature. Okay, it wants eight electrons. And so what it does is it rapidly goes around, bumps into something else, and steals an electron. So if we look at the upper right-hand picture, this is actually <clears throat> a, lip, a lipid layer, um, probably on the cell wall. It bounces, and it will steal an electron. Now that leaves a molecule. Uh, lacking an electron, so guess what? It bounces into its neighbor, steals another electron, and so forth and so forth down the line. So it sort of causes a chain reaction. Now looking at the lower left-hand picture, we can see if this happens enough in a small area, it can actually lead to erosion of the cell membrane, okay? Causing things in the cell to leak out, or things to leak in when they shouldn't, when that shouldn't be happening. So that could lead to significant damage of the cell membrane and could potentially lead to cellular damage, you know, on a, on a wider scale or cellular death. Now what are antioxidants? Antioxidants are sort of special kind of molecules. You know, they have a lot of electrons and they can give up an electron without <clears throat> any, any problem. And so, so they're unique in nature. They're found <clears throat> all over the place, I mean, primarily in fruits and vegetables, uh, very beneficial. And um, they can actually reduce or eliminate a lot of the oxidative stresses that our bodies incur. In fact, our bodies can also produce <clears throat> antioxidant substances and, um, you know, one of those is uh, CoQ10, um, ubiquinol, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but uh, very important um, uh, molecules um, that, that help prevent the oxidative stress um, that, that our bodies endure, you know, <laughs> on a daily basis. And pretty much every minute of every day, there are, there's a lot of free radicals being formed that need to be dealt with. So let's advance the slide, please. Okay, what do uh, free radicals and oxidative stress do to our tissues? Okay, and you can see pretty much every organ system in the body is affected by free radicals. But I'm going to zero in on the skin, and I'm going there because we can see, you know, the skin is a sort of a barometer for what the rest of the body is doing. And, and you can look at a person, you know, and you can tell pretty, pretty quickly whether that person is healthy and vital or whether that person is sick and run down just by looking at their physical appearance. And the skin is a big part of that. I went to a high school reunion. This is uh, oh, my 
30th high school reunion, something like that. I believe it was the 30th. And uh, this woman walked in, and I literally thought she was the mother of one of my classmates, okay? But she wasn't. She was actually one of my classmates. And she had aged more dramatically than anybody else that was in the, in, in the group at the party. And it was because of lifestyle. I mean, she was a heavy smoker, spent a lot of time in the sun. So a lot of the things that cause free radicals, tissue damage, i.e. skin damage, was readily apparent in her. And I think that we all have friends, we have acquaintances, we say, wow, you know, they look like they're aging much faster than they should be. And the fact of the matter is they are, and it's all because of the free radicals and the oxidative stresses that these free radicals are causing. So let's move on to the next slide, please. What sorts of things can we do to help limit the, the damage that uh, these free radicals are causing? What can we do to, to ensure? And uh, <clears throat> this is the anti-aging food pyramid, and I think if you look at it, and if you're already involved with the Migrate 28 uh, program, you're going to see that our program, you know, closely, you know, mirrors this anti-aging food, food pyramid. And at the bottom, you know, the broadest layer is pure filtered water. Water is the most important nutrient in our diet. And as Dr. Mike said, you need to drink at least 100 ounces if you're 200 pounds or less because it is so important. It helps your body function at a higher level, okay? So when your body is well hydrated, everything is going to work better. You're going to produce fewer free radicals. You're going to help eliminate those toxins that can lead to the production of more free radicals, okay? And so pure filtered water is you know, the most essential nutrient, and you have to get enough of it to make sure that everything works the way it's supposed to. Supplements. Dr. Mike talked about a few of them. He talked about the optimals. Now, the optimals are not just vitamins and minerals, okay? They are packed with a lot of the phytonutrients, okay, that are found in fruits and vegetables. These phytonutrients have important antioxidant properties, okay? Plus, the vitamins and minerals help ensure that your body is working, you know, at, at its peak level of performance, okay? If things are working the way they're supposed to be working, there's going to be less formation of free radicals, so very, very important. We also have other um, supplements in the program. We have the MOA. We have the Rejuvenex. Again, these are packed with um, antioxidants and phytonutrients, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Next up on the list are low glycemic <clears throat> whole fruits, and um, I like this, above ground green leafy vegetables, okay? Um, that excludes uh, potatoes and sweet potatoes, so <clears throat> those grow below ground. Uh, but the green leafy vegetables, those are loaded with phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are things that, you know, we are only beginning to learn all of the benefits of, of these, these important um, uh, components of uh, uh, the, the good quality foods that we're supposed to be eating. Um, <clears throat> so the more green leafy vegetables, um, the better off you are. Low glycemic index uh, carbs like whole grain cereals, legumes, and nuts. Uh, they have a lot of important vitamins and antioxidants, vitamin E in particular, uh, very important for helping prevent the uh, formation of uh, free radicals. Then we move up to uh, organic eggs, the good quality fats, uh, you know, cold water fish, uh, free range poultry, lean red meats, and at the very top of the, uh, top of the pyramid there where it should be are sweets. Okay? Those simple carbohydrates, um, they really have um, <clears throat> very few, if any, antioxidant sort, sort of uh, properties. Uh, they're, they're meant to be, you know, the, the dessert, that little something special, okay, um, and, and not 
not the uh, the preponderance of your of your meal. So very limited amounts of those. Um, um, so we focus on the foods at the bottom in larger amounts and only only on occasion and only for a real treat and in very limited amounts. You know something uh, something that's uh, that's uh, sweet. Um, but uh, not terribly nutritious. So let's go on to the next slide, please, Whitson. When we look at antioxidant ratings, okay, there's a scale that we use. It's called the ORAC scale. Okay, what that is, it's the oxygen radical absorbance capacity. Okay, and in a nutshell, it means how how good is something at reducing free radicals. Okay, and we're not, you know, we're, we're what we're doing is we're just uh, adding an electron back to that oxygen molecule. Okay, so at the top of the list is here in this scale is the the maquis berry. Okay, followed by blueberry, mangosteen, acai, noni, and pomegranate. And you can ask yourself, well, how am I going to get all of this stuff? I've never had a maquis berry. I've never had an acai berry. Probably never had a mangosteen. You know, maybe had a pomegranate, uh, noni. I've never seen out those on the shelf. Blueberries. You know, I grew up in Michigan. You know, in an area that grew a lot of blueberries, so I ate a lot of those over the years. You know, but <clears throat> most of these fruits, you know, are not readily available. And when we look at each of these fruits, you know, I mean, they come from all over the world. They have a very high, you know, uh, uh, oxygen radical absorbance capacity, and you know they work in different ways, and that and that's important. Okay, when we look at free rad, uh, when we look at antioxidants, some antioxidants will work better in some tissues than others. Okay, and um, it's important to get a whole, I mean, a variety, a whole host of uh, different uh, fruits and vegetables to to provide as many antioxidants as you possibly can, because these free radicals are occurring throughout our body. Now, when we look at the bottom five uh, fruits on here, those are all found in our MOA. You know, MOA is part, uh, part of the packs, okay? And so uh, two shots a day is going to give you a, a full complement of these five plus many other um, antioxidants. And if you're taking your Rejuvenix, Guess what? Maquis berry is in the rejuvenix. So guess what? In your program, in your packs, okay, you have all of these plus more um, antioxidants um, than you ever imagined you were taking. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, MOA and the rejuvenix are going to be a part of my life uh, because I'm getting a lot of you know extra free radicals, you know, being in so much sunshine. And um, if you really um, want to uh, uh, boost the um, antioxidants, uh, the, uh, the vanali, okay, grapeseed extract, um, is very, very important. Um, vanali, um, you know, uh, provides grapes, grapeseed extract plus uh, two or three different varieties of vitamin C. A very potent antioxidant combination, and the one thing about grapeseed extract is it freely crosses the blood-brain barrier. Okay, that's a barrier that prevents a lot of things from uh, <clears throat> getting close to the brain. Basically, to protect the brain, to protect it so it can function as it should. Um, but in terms of antioxidants, um, the grapeseed extract is one of the few that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, the, uh, the brain consumes a lot of oxygen, so there's a lot of free radicals being formed in there. Um, so Vanali is another uh, product that uh, I'm convinced um, is going to um, to help uh, you know help preserve me as time goes on. And I would encourage everybody to uh, uh, to take take the Vanali as well. So I think we've got one more slide, Woodson, and um, this is a little cartoon, and uh, antioxidant kicking out the free radicals. She's actually not kicking out the free radicals. She actually embraces these free radicals, 
donates an electron to them and sends them off on their way as, uh, as normal um, oxygen molecules. So that's it for my presentation, Woodson. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Gregg. And I, um, the anti-aging food pyramid, for me, that was just, I, I took a screenshot of it because that's something I think we all should have on our refrigerator or a bathroom mirror, just, mm -hmm. just as a reminder. I loved that, and I loved everything else, but that really spoke out to me, and, and I think we all just need to be cognizant of the free radicals we come in contact with every day. They add up very, very quickly, um, and the damage that they can do, I, I just never realized. Yep. And you know, one thing that, you know, that really excited me about this program, you know, the Migrate 28, um, you know, the preferred food list is, you know, uh, it, it, it is all about health. You know, are, are, we, are we losing weight for cosmetic reasons? Are we losing weight because of health? Okay. And there's a lot of programs out there that focus on the cosmetic benefits of weight loss. But this program here is really geared totally about, um, you know, keeping people healthy. You know, as Deanna Latson said, you know, <laughs> you know, I want to die young at a very old age. Okay? And there's no reason we shouldn't be able to do that. And, you know, it's, it's all about the things that we put into our body um, and um, eliminating or reducing the bad and increasing the good. And, uh, you know, the benefits, uh, I mean, you can't buy health. Um, and so, you know, so the benefits of this program are going to be so long-lasting and hopefully um, so wide-ranging um, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, people are going to uh, be able to live uh, healthier and longer <laughs> and more vital lives. Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. I, I think that I echo that sentiment, and I think everyone else does. Well, now we're going to switch gears one more time, and we're going to go back to Dr. Mike, because this is the big question, and, and this is a topic that we get the most questions about, weight loss versus fat loss, because there is a difference, a big difference. Which one would you rather have? So to answer that question, Dr. Mike, talk to us. Really, you know, I thought losing a pound was losing a pound. Tell me what the difference is. Losing a pound is losing a pound, but it may either work for you or against you, depending on what went away. And we're going to use a set of slides generated by some of my clients. And the important thing to understand is these are real-world examples. And in my, in my coaching series, as the individuals come in, we don't just check their weight. We actually, and, and yes, there are scales out there that can do this automatically. I happen to have one of them. Uh, but we track not just the weight. We also track the body mass index, the body fat percentage, the muscle percentage, the percentage of visceral fat. That's that stubborn fat that sits right around the midsection of the body and you know, um, twice this weekend I heard somebody refer to it as their keg. And then the last thing that we track is that KCAL number, is the number of calories that that individual at that current weight would need to consume to neither gain nor lose any weight. You can forget all of the stuff that I just talked about and just focus on three things. The weight, the body fat percentage, and the muscle. So. This individual, the first week that they started on the program, weighed 198, 198.6 pounds. Their body fat percentage at that time was 46.3%. After five weeks on the program, they weighed 192.4 pounds. They had only lost six point, rounding it up, 6.2 pounds. And they were somewhat, you know, dismayed. But they also come in, and this is fairly standard, they also come in and go, my clothes are hanging off of me, my co-workers all notice this, that, you know, their, their faces are slimming down, the cheekbones are more prominent, but they're looking at the scale and there's this disconnect. They know that they feel better. Folks around them are telling them that they must have lost a ton of weight, and yet the scale only, in this particular case, reflects a little over six pounds. What we do with the numbers is best shown in more detail 
in the next slide. If you take the starting weight of that individual, 198.6 pounds, the starting fat percentage was 46.3, so you take 198.6 and you multiply it by 0.463 because percentage is actually over 1.0 or part of 800. So at the beginning of the program, this person, this woman had 91.95 pounds of fat on their frame. 91.95 pounds of fat sitting on a 198.6 pound frame. On the fifth week of the program, their total weight was 192.4. The total weight loss was only 6.2 pounds. Her fat percentage at the end of the fifth week was 37%. So we multiply that 192.4, her current weight, by her current fat percentage, 0 0.370. So she's now carrying 71.19 pounds of fat. A, 91.95, was the starting amount of fat on her frame. B, was the amount of fat on her frame at the end of five weeks. And the next slide shows a fairly straightforward mathematics equation. And please, math was never my strong subject, so I had to make this easily doable and believable for my purposes as well. A minus B in this situation is, in fact, the amount of fat lost. And guess how much fat she lost? She lost 20.76 pounds of fat. The weight lost was only 6.2 pounds. Now, how is it possible to have lost that much fat and yet the scale only reflect a smaller, much smaller number? Part of the answer is on our program, on the program that I specifically implement. As soon as I can, I have the individual sit down with a personal trainer and we design an exercise program, a resistance exercise program, that in 20 to 30 minutes will give them more workout than they would normally get from spending an hour and a half at the gym. And yes, it's, it's a personalized program, it's a personalized prescription, but it rapidly builds muscle. And that's what happened to this individual. They lost a ton of fat, but they also put on muscle. So the net loss was only 6.2 pounds. Once I go through this, and I do this with each client who asks the same question, I go through their entire uh, set of biometric numbers, and I take out the numbers and I show, show and I show them because here was your starting weight, here was your starting fat percentage, you know. So, and I I go through the entire process with them so they see it step by step by step by step. And if they don't understand part of it, I go back and make sure that they do understand. At the end of it, they're sitting there going, "Oh my God, I've only lost 6.2 pounds, but I really lost over 20 pounds of fat. No wonder my clothes are hanging off of me. No wonder I feel so much stronger." No wonder my coworkers, my family, my boyfriend, they're all commenting on, my God, you know, you look so good, your cheekbones are showing. And it's actually slightly funny because I've had one female client and her closest friends accused her of lying. Because, you know, she walks in and she's lost a small amount of weight, less than 10 pounds. And they think, in their estimation, knowing her from years before, they think she's lost 35 pounds. And she's going, oh, no, no, I've, left, I've lost less than 10. They, should, they think she's lying and holding out on them. It can get a little tough and rough sometimes. But put this into perspective. The next slide. If she lost 20.76 pounds of fat, she's now fitting into smaller clothes. If you lose 20.76 pounds of fat, that means you're carrying more muscle. If you lose a little over 20 pounds of fat, that means your heart is not working as hard to pump blood through all that fat tissue. If you lost that much fat, that means that your hormones are actually available to you as a human being. Because here's a very strange and interesting thing. Fat tissue we used to think of as metabolically inactive. It just sits there, it does nothing. Well. That's not actually the truth. Fat actually puts out a fair number of hormones on its own, and yes, sometimes it's to protect fat, but it also has enzymes that, in the case of men, for example, the more body fat a man has, the less testosterone he has available to his body. He may make a lot of testosterone, 
but it very rapidly gets converted to other things including estrogen. If you're a woman with a certain amount of body fat on you, you know this to be the truth. You have irregular periods. You either have infertility or sometimes it seems like you just look at your partner and <laughs> you're looking at pregnancy in the face. In other words, excess fat messes you up in so many different ways. If we get the fat off of you, not just the weight, if we specifically get the fat off of you, we rapidly push you back into a healthy state. So the next time you look at the scale and you're only seeing X number and you want more, check your premises. Are your clothes a whole lot looser than they were before? Are you getting compliments from folks, even strangers? I have one nurse who's being stopped by housekeeping, uh, delivery people in the hospital. They're going, you know, you don't know me, but I've been watching you over the last couple of months. You look amazing. And she's like, but I only lost, I haven't even lost, she's only lost, I think, to date 19 pounds. But she's put on over 46 pounds of muscle. So she's a slimmer, more petite frame and she's more energetic than before and her skin is glowing and she's happier because she can do so much more than before. Next time you see that the scale is not showing as much weight as you think you deserve to have lost, if you have the ability, do the breakdown, check the fat versus weight, check the fat versus muscle, do the numbers from beginning to end and you might actually be quite surprised at the progress that you've already made except you didn't know about it. This was fantastic. Oh my goodness, that is just incredible. Um, all three segments, I'm, my phone is, it's, it's funny, I'm getting message after message after message. <laughs> and I want to thank um, both of you, Dr. Greg and Dr. Mike, for explaining um, about the difference in the scale versus clothes. What oxidative stress means and why these free radicals and why some people hyper age and they don't and this is a health program that a lot of people say, you look like you're turning back the clock. Well, there's real science behind everything that we're doing. And then the one and the six, the little things that we're doing that might be um, sending us forward or setting us back. So I think this week has just been a great amount of information. I want to thank you um, both so, so much. We do have just a handful of frequently asked questions, and I know we want to keep this um, within the hour, but is, would either one of you really quickly want to um, tackle one of these questions? We can save them for next week, but um, I see sugar bomb, sugar bomb, sugar bomb, sugar bomb, um, and all four of these questions. So <laughs> hey, there you <laughs> go. <laughs> Uh, let, let me take a stab at quickly answering um, all four, and then Greg, you give your input on all four as well. My pleasure, yes. Is there any other sweetener we can use other than stevia? No. Why? Because stevia is, it's not a sugar. Every other sugar, every other sweetener out there, unfortunately, is a sugar. And why would you knowingly consume a sugar bomb? Yogurt, is it healthy? Yes. Is it great for you and your weight loss? No, because it's really a sugar bomb. Different yogurts may have a little bit more protein than others, but they are still mostly carbohydrates, so it's still classified as a sugar bomb. Protein bars. What protein bars are approved for my grade 28 plan that I know of? None. And I hate to say that because, yes, we're still looking. I have clients constantly bringing me different protein bars, and there's nothing out there that consistently fits the bill. And it has to do with the binders used. They're mostly sugars. What if I want to have a glass of wine with dinner a few times a week? Okay, go ahead. But be prepared not to have the same rate of weight loss as somebody who's not. Because at the end of the day, the alcohol, essentially, it's, it's an oversimplification to say that alcohol turns to sugar, but it behaves like a sugar bomb. And if you're consuming a sugar bomb three times a week, and every time you do one, it slows you or stops you for three days. Well, guess what? Three glasses of wine spread throughout the week means that you're not going to have any success for nine days. Oh, that's right. There's only seven days in the week. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so that's my take. Well, uh, question number one, stevia is natural. Okay. Now, there are non-sugar sweeteners out there, and, and uh, 
Uh, they're, they're chemically based. Most of them are neurotoxins. Okay? You, you put these on an ant hill, the ants will die. Um, so why would, why would you put something in your body that, that can kill living creatures? You know, I, ju I just don't understand it. Um, so, uh, and, and you know, there's some thought out there that these artificial sweeteners can actually trick the brain into thinking that you're actually getting sugar. Okay? Now the brain is sort of the conductor. It, it dictates to the rest of our body what happens. And I've seen it over and over again in various weight loss programs that I worked with. People aren't losing weight. They aren't losing weight. They switch from, Diet Coke, from regular Coke to Diet Coke and they're still not losing weight. But guess what? Once they get off that Diet Coke and start drinking water, the weight falls off. So there's some thought out there that these artificial sweeteners actually trick the brain into thinking you're getting sugar and the body behaves like you're getting sugar. So cut them out. Stevia uh, doesn't behave that way. Yogurt, you know, I personally like yogurt, but you know what? There's lactose. Lactose is a sugar. You know, it's found in milk, okay? Plus, there's all sorts of hormones and other things that are found in milk. I mean, if it's, if it's not organic and, and raised, you know, uh, produced in the, in the way it's supposed to be produced, you're getting a lot of extra hormones and you don't need those things. So stay away from, stay away from milk, stay away from cheese, stay away from yogurt. Protein bars, like Dr. Mike said, loaded with sugar bombs. You read the fine print, there's a lot of carbohydrates in there, there's a lot of sugars in there that they're not, and these sugars are hidden. They're, they're, they're not you know, um, read, readily proclaimed in that sort of uh, nutrient uh, content on the label, but they're in there. And wine, you know, wine, you know, alcohol does behave like a carbohydrate. Um, it's a simple carbohydrate. Um, not only that, you know, um, one glass of wine might lead to two glasses of wine, you know. And, you know, after a couple glasses of wine, your guard is lowered. And guess what? You're eating things that you shouldn't be eating. You know, you're, you're not as focused. You're, you're not as clear. You know, your direction isn't as clear. And um, you may add other things in that you normally wouldn't um, in your diet uh, on, on this program. So it's best to stay away from it. Dr. Gregory, you still there? I totally agree with with. Yep, that. I'm here. Yep. Oh, good, good. But yeah, drinking a glass of wine to me was just like drinking a Snickers bar. I had come so far, <laughs> I just it wasn't worth it. It was not worth that liquid sugar coming in, especially at night, um, yep. for all of that. So I love y'all's take on those. Well, everybody, here's your homework: get your progress numbers to your coaches as soon as you can. Go to the Facebook page. If you haven't gone to the Migrate 28 Facebook page, do that. We've got updates coming in regularly. And then next week is a major milestone. So let's get to it and let's take an assessment of where you are. And once again, I want to thank Dr. Greg and Dr. Mike for a wonderful training tonight. Um, and I just can't wait to see and hear everybody's progress this week. It's going to be exciting. I'm looking thank you, forward. Olson. Yep. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. <clears throat>